Hello, and thanks very much for joining us today for the Insight Story. This is a series of fireside chats when we go behind the scenes into the latest data and trends into what people are doing right the way across the internet, social media, mobile devices, and e-commerce. And in today's show, I am very pleased to welcome one of my all-time data heroes, Chase Buckle, VP of Trends at GWI. Chase, thank you so much for joining us today. The honors are mine. Thanks for having me. No worries. So just before we start, do you want to tell people a little bit about what you do in your day-to-day -day role and a little bit, just in case people don't know who GWI is, which I'm sure they will do, but just a little bit about who you are and what GWI does. Sure. So starting with GWI, um, we're an audience profiling company. We run the world's, world's largest uh, online survey into the digital consumer. We track almost 50 different countries. We Every year we do about 800,000 um, different surveys uh, among internet users aged 16 to 64 across the world. We track all of their digital lives um, from how they use social media, what their attitudes are, all the psychographic stuff, um, what they're doing online, why they go online, how they interact with brands, really the kind of full spectrum of um, what a brand would be interested in in uh, internet users we track. And I'm the VP of Trends. So the Trends team are the data storytellers in GWI. We look at all of the data we have. We create reports, uh, blogs, infographics, webinars, presentations, all the different bits of content to pull those stories out and bring them to the world. Nice. And you're making sense of all the data, basically. It's your role is to turn numbers into insights and stories. That's right, yeah. Excellent. So based on all of them, the fact that you do 800,000 survey surveys a year just blows my mind. It is clearly one of the biggest, if not the biggest survey into mm, the exactly. online world in general, what people are doing. Based on your analysis of all the data that you collect in those trends, what, what are the key things that you've been pulling out that you're most interested in, inspired by, all that kind of stuff in the recent sets of data? Yeah, so to be honest, it's actually um, one of the topics up for discussion today is really the thing I've been focusing on a lot recently, which is new internet users. Now, one of the things I just told you was that we track internet users aged 16 to 64. Now, when you are doing a survey across almost 50 different countries, well, obviously, um, each country has its own demographic profile and also the internet penetration of each country changes. So in fast growth countries in Southeast Asia, Latin America, some places in East Africa, what you find is that lower internet penetration rates um, mean that basically people who have access to the internet tend to be younger, they tend to be more affluent, they tend to be urban, they tend to be more educated. And that was sort of the, uh, sorry, and then in sort of, you know, US, UK, um, other Western sort of countries, you have like much higher um, online penetration, the old, the, the demographic skews of those countries, they skew old. So you get a very different right. pe bunch of people who are online, right? Now, the, the last wave of uh, people coming online on the internet have been typically those, you know, those young, those urban, those affluent, those educated people in these countries. And with them, they've brought loads of innovation. I mean, just look at what's coming out of China, right? Like China's mm. internet penetration grew massively. And a lot of people are online in China now, but, you know, it still is, it does skew towards those, those, those traits towards, um, I just said. Now, there's a lot of innovation coming out there. And for these people that have come online in the last 10, 15 years, well, like a bit more, sorry, then what you find is that for them, internet, social media, commerce, they're just synonymous. Like, you know, but whereas for someone like me or you, maybe where we came online, well, for me, it was like in the early 2000s, um, these things grew over time, right? And so we have a different view yeah. of the internet. But now what we're seeing is a new type of person coming online. And that type of person is a bit more likely to be rural, they're a bit more likely to be less educated, lower income. So what you're finding is that internet penetration is breaking past that initial sort of, you know, younger affluent person and breaking past and going into the rural, the less educated, the lower income people. Now, I think this is going to push us towards a more inclusive internet because what these yep. people, the way that they interact with the internet is completely different, right? They're less confident, we find, because we actually did a survey. Um, so we have a Zeitgeist uh, data product, which we have our main core data product. So I don't want to get too technical for you. Um, <laughs> our main core data product. And we have this Zeitgeist, which is basically a recontact. So we can recontact people. So what we did is right. we asked people, how long have you had access to either fixed or mobile um, internet? And we narrowed down on the people who have been very recently. And like I say, rural, well, more rural, 
more less educated, less income. Mm. And we find that they have a very different view of the internet. Right? They have they're they're less confident um, with the internet. They're less likely to be doing sort of the broader range of activities that other people are doing. They're more likely to be doing stuff like voice and more likely to be using stuff like visual stuff like videos. And I think that could right. be down to lower rates lower rates of literacy. But I guess what we're viewing uh -huh. here is like a new wave of people on coming online. And I think this is like I say, this is going to push us towards a, a more inclusive internet. It's really interesting. I think you, you've mentioned a couple of bits in there already, but the kinds of behaviors that those newer users are exhibiting is the bit that I'm finding most interesting. I, I spend a lot of time obviously living inside your data as well, because you're a fantastic partner for our global reports. And just looking at some of the trends that are coming through in that. So there's a few different bits that really strike me as important for marketers, but also policymakers and various other stakeholders to make sense of the evolving motivations for the reasons why people are coming online and especially what's bringing those newer users online for the first time today. So I'd like to think that it's fairly obvious why people would want to come onto the internet because there's so much value in there. It's such a broad thing now, the internet. But in terms of what you've been tracking in the data, is there any particular one thing that is really driving people online, for example, like social media, or is it right the way across the gamut? That's a good question. Um, we tend to find, if you, look, if you narrow down these people and you look at reasons for using the internet, they under-index for a lot of the things compared to a normal internet user. But what we do find mm. is that they are more likely to be doing stuff like watching educational videos, um, <laughs> stuff towards, I, I guess, more ambition, because I think for a lot of these people, the internet is about opportunity. It's about bringing them or their family new opportunities um, to sort of work up, you know, in the social mobility side of things. Yeah. Um, so for me, I guess that's the standout thing is how can the internet empower them? And I think that that would be whatever motivations and whatever behaviors are linked to that, that's where they would stand out. For stuff like so using social media, don't get me wrong, they do that. But we have to bear in mind that these people are probably restricted by data plans. So for the kind right. of activities that you would be doing as someone with a fixed line or whatever, like they they won't be as um, as prone to you doing those activities quite in the same way as, as a normal internet user would. So it's fair to say the vast majority of these new users are coming on via mobile phones, typically yeah. smartphones still, or are we, yeah. we still seeing people using feature phones? Is this still a thing? Yes, yeah, well, yeah, for a while, actually, there was a bit of a weird trend going on in Japan where feature phones were just still so popular, even against like, you know, this massive <laughs> smartphone usage, but I mean, that has subsided. There are people that still use feature phones, don't get me wrong, but um, yeah, smartphones are obviously the, the main online portal. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to bring up one of the charts from our January reports here, which is all about the motivations why people use the internet. So this is the main reasons people obviously coming online for a variety of different reasons. And as you can see, they could select multiple different answers here, which is why the percentages will add up to well more than 100. But I still find it interesting that the, the number one reason people say they're coming online is still to find information. Then we're looking at staying in touch with friends and family keeping up with news and then what you might want to call entertainment. So watching videos, TV shows and movies, although Chase, you haven't just referenced that they're over indexing when it comes to watching educational videos, also really quite interesting. I think it would be really interesting just to dig into each of those, perhaps in slightly more detail and um, where relevant to make reference to the behaviors of the newer users, but perhaps compare and contrast to the the older folks, if that's not too derogatory a way of discussing older people. Um, so I think, you know, finding information, first of all, we've seen in your data a lot of evolution in search behaviors. And I use search kind of, you know, I hesitated even to use the word because when I say search, people automatically think of search engines. But your data tells us that those behaviors have broadened quite significantly beyond the typical Google search, although that's still an important feature. What are the key bits that you're pulling out and you're discussing with your clients when it comes to how people find information online? So I guess, yeah, voice is one of the, the main ones. Um, voice has definitely broadened its demographic profile to all new internet users. And to be honest, that applies to so many things, especially since the pandemic. Um, yeah, we're finding the lots of older people are now using voice uh, in terms of like how people are using voice, exactly what they're doing on there. That's something we're going to be exploring further in the future. Um, so, uh, you got any spoilers on that one? Got any insights uh, no, you can share? Done research yet. Sorry, <laughs> we, right. uh, this is another thing we're going to do, like a new new survey. Nice. Okay. 
So voice, a big part of this, you've already got in, in the, the data set you've got now, they're searching for information, but they're also using it to control, I'm guessing this is more in the sort of the more Western affluent markets, they're using it to control some of their smart home devices. But based on your understanding of the behaviors, I'm, I'm guessing that finding information is a, a big share of the overall voice activity. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of other things people can do. To be honest, we have done that kind of research I mentioned, you know, what exactly are people doing on their voice assistants or whatever. We have done that in the past, and admittedly, it was about a year ago or so. But um, we tend to find that you know, lots of the stuff that gets a lot of hype, ordering groceries, this, that, and the other, like that happens. But it's much more niche. You know, the lion's share really? of why people do it is just to find out, you know, a quick bit of information because it's, a, it's essentially a convenience tool, right? Yeah, it's really interesting because when you when you do a voice search, you're likely to get one single answer. So it tends to be kind of yeah. rather than research as such, where you're maybe going to look at a few different sources of information or inspiration. It's more like, what was the name of the actor that was in that show, or who was this? So, you know, this is typically the way that we use it in our house, which is you know not exactly the world's most representative sample, but nonetheless, I think it's really interesting that what the stereotype in marketing of voice search is versus what the person on the street is using it for, I think is perhaps, that's quite, quite a disjoint in there. One of the things that really stood out in one of our previous conversations when I was asking you for all the insights into how voice is being used, and you were making it very clear that it's all about use on mobile phones rather than on smart speakers. Now, I know smart speakers are important, but what sort of share are we looking at? Is it the vast majority is taking place on mobile phones or are we seeing a bit of evolution there? Yeah, the vast majority, I would say. I mean, th don't get me wrong, actually, one of the big trends we saw during the pandemic was the growth in um, smart speaker usage, or sorry, adoption. Right. Ownership of smart speakers went up quite a lot. Um, and that was across lots of different areas of the world. But nevertheless, it's still mainly on mobile. And if you come, it comes down to accessibility, right? Like the cost of smart speakers, um, the fact that you can just reach into your pocket. I think you just can't get past that. There's, there's always going to be mainly on mobile and the smart speakers will find their groove of how people use them. Yeah. Just a reminder, I forgot to say this at the beginning, uh, for the folks that are tuning in, if you've got questions for Chase, please do pop those into the comments if you're on LinkedIn or YouTube. I'm afraid Twitter folks, you're not going to be able to send us your questions directly. But if you hop over to either LinkedIn or YouTube, then you can ask your questions directly. Just put them in the comments and we'll do our best to address those for you during the live stream. Let me just bring up the data that you shared for the Q3 stuff, Chase, for adoption of voice assistance by country. So this sort of alludes to what you were saying, people coming online perhaps in less of the metropolitan areas or maybe a little bit more towards the, the smaller towns, the rural areas. The fact that China and India dominate that in terms of adoption rates amongst working age internet users, I find really, really interesting, partly because they're both really big countries, obviously that alludes to the, the size of the opportunity there, but also because of the language perspective. I think one of the things that is most sort of interesting when you look at the future of the internet is how different kinds of culture and different kinds of language content are going to come through. Do you have any insights based on the research that you've been doing as to what role language is playing in the adoption of these tools, whether Mandarin being quite a difficult um, language to type into a device, for example, is that facilitating the adoption of uh, voice assistance, or is it something different? So I'll put my hands off and say I haven't looked into that specifically in the last okay. <laughs> in a little while. But, um, spot now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but uh, no, I think you know we do track, uh, for example, like using voice translation tools and and these sorts of stuff, and we do tend to find that like there is crossover a lot of you know people using that sort of stuff and using um, voice assistance a lot. I think you hit something there as well when it comes to. Um, uh, how difficult it is to input language into a mobile phone. Yeah. So, and I, I think actually what you can look at is you can look at something like WhatsApp, for example. Um, you tend to find mm. that people in countries like China, I mean, they don't use WhatsApp obviously as much as other people do, but like other countries where maybe you have the same sort of issue where it might be harder to input text, they use, uh, they rely on voice recordings more. Um, and right. we are seeing an increase in that in the West, but more so in, in Asian countries. Uh, and are you see, do, I don't know whether this is tracked in the data that you've been looking at, but are you seeing that particularly coming through amongst people who are newer to the internet? My hypothesis is that if you've never learned to type, I can't quite imagine why you would, considering that you've now got these fantastic voice interfaces that allow you to conduct your searches, to share information with friends and family, and even to 
to dictate to a certain extent if you need to type out some stuff, although I don't know to what extent that would be part of newer users' behaviors. But are you seeing anything of that coming through in the data, like comparing the newer users versus the, the more seasoned? Uh, it was something I sort of briefly looked at, and I did see that there was a decent amount of um, newer internet users using stuff like voice translation tools. Although I, I right. don't think it was like much more or less than the typical person, because um, they have to find this this functionality in the first place, right? And if right. their if their literacy skills may be lower, or their their confidence in the technology might be lower it's a case of actually getting to that feature on the phone. So that might be a, a barrier in itself. Yeah, it's an interesting, I mean, I would love to know when we're talking about rural areas across perhaps places like rural China, still seeing a lot of growth in internet users, obviously right the way across Africa, you're seeing quite strong growth as well. I'd be really interested to know how the very first experience goes. Is it the case that somebody buys it? I'm not asking you to necessarily tell me whether your data tells this, but just the hypothesis that people get their phone and then they go off into a corner on their own and work out how it works. Or if they sit down with a friend or a group of people from their family and it's this experience of working out how it works together. Have you got any insights into how that works? So <clears throat> this is a really difficult, a very elusive audience, a very difficult to find. If you yeah. think about like, I, mean, not, I don't want to bash our methodology at all because it's obviously a, a great methodology, but um, getting people who have just joined the internet, especially people who might have less confidence and notice with skills to then take an online survey is going to be very difficult. Totally something not going to happen. No, I totally relate. Yeah. Kind of, something I would point you towards is Google's The Next Billion initiative. So they've done yeah. qualitative research with new internet users and they found that they tend to rely on friend, friends and family members to try and show mm. them it's really interesting actually i would definitely recommend anyone um to go check out the next billion by um by google nice that, that's been around for a while i'm assuming this is an ongoing study that they update on a regular basis is that right uh i'm not sure when they last updated it but um i think it's in the last few years i'm not sure yeah, it's, it's fascinating. So I totally echo that recommendation. I think all of the stuff, whether it's from the, the you know, the Google Next Billion stuff, also looking at things like the Alliance for Affordable Internet, do some fascinating studies into getting people online for the first time and the barrier to that. Also GSMA intelligence, giving some great insights into mobile internet in particular. So if you wanna, if you viewers today, if you wanna dig into that kind of data in more detail, I will share a bunch of resources in the comments after today's show. Um, you can go in and look at those. But Chase, another one of the new search behaviors that we get a lot of questions about actually from the readers of our reports. And it's one of the ones that fascinates me most because I can't quite make sense of it. I know it's happening, but it's one of those things that because of COVID and me not going out quite as much as I used to, I haven't seen as much of this in the real world, but use of image recognition tools. Um, so this is the data from your Q3 survey, really quite high. So these are each month. So the percentage of working age internet users who use an image recognition tool like in uh, Pinterest lens or Google lens on their mobile each month. And as you can see at the top end of that scale, people in South America, close to half of them already using image recognition tools each month. So question number one, put you on the spot. I know we've I'm talked about this before, but I'm gonna ask you it again. <laughs> Why is it so big in Latin America? What is it that's driving that? I knew you were gonna ask me this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. spot for it. I am really struggling to find out myself, to be honest. We've done a lot of desk research into why this might be the case. I mean, one thing we found is they're just a lot more engaged with services like Google in the first place, like Google Apps, Google Search. So it could be the case that, you know, it's a very short journey for them to go from that app and then, but it's still, it doesn't really explain everything. And it's something which I am actively trying to find out more information about. We <laughs> now do monthly surveys in markets, including Brazil. Um, right. So, I mean, we do have an opportunity to look into that in the future, and that is on our to-do list. Um, but I'm sorry, I can't give you much in the way of that. No, I, some wild guesses, really. I kind of, I suspected that was going to be the answer, but I just find it, it's really, really interesting. Right? When you look at a lot of these trends, like, so you look at the search trends and voice that we just saw when you've got China and India leading that, you look at the image recognition tool use and it's really extending in Latin America. What, what really stands out to me in a lot of your data is what you might, as a marketer, what you might call as innovative behavior, so use of newer technologies, is really being championed across those more developing economies. So it's not coming through in the English-speaking Western markets as much yet. 
any insights into why that might be the case? Is it because people have developed habits in their earlier years and they're just too, sort of, <laughs> they're too old to change? Or what's going on here? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, how we use the internet can't just change overnight, really. And right. when you're when you're like a newer internet user, then I think you're a lot more malleable because of your expectations are much less defined. You, the possibilities of what you think can happen are much less defined. Um, I think that for, it goes back to what something I said earlier, where these people are coming online and they're coming online in a world where, um, like for example, social media product research is just so mainstream in places like that that it. Yeah, and using image search, you know, getting the possibility to rather than painstakingly go through your search, uh, your news feeds and try and find something, you can just take a picture of something. It's just much more appealing and they get it more. Whereas in, in the Western countries, much more entrenched behaviors, things are much more slow. Like, for example, look at social commerce in general. People have been talking about social commerce being on the brink of mainstream adoption in these countries for well over yeah. a decade now, right? Like, but I mean, you just saw these very small incremental changes and places like Facebook, they're just at pains to try and change consumer behavior because of, it is a very difficult thing to change in um, in these Western, more mature countries. That's a, a good cue to dig into social media in a bit more detail. Um, so <laughs> you've set up a whole bunch of questions for me already. I don't quite know where to start. Um, let's, let's start with the social commerce work because I know that it is going to be a very popular topic for a lot of people that are listening today. In terms of the data that you're tracking in the GWI survey, What's the momentum of social commerce, specifically in terms of buying things on social networks? Are you seeing strong growth or is it still relatively incremental quarter on quarter? I think it's incremental. I mean, we still see that in these mature markets, social commerce is really defined as discovery and research. Right. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of efforts to try and get that holy grail of people buying in apps. And, you know, that does happen sometimes, but it's not something which is just going to spike. And, you know, if it would have spiked, it would have done so during the pandemic when, um, you know, commerce boomed and social media usage boomed and stuff. So, yeah, it is a very incremental growth. And like I say, it's really about discovery, I think, um, and research right. on these platforms in the West. But that in itself is really interesting. I think, you know, so trying to make a distinction between the discovery bit versus the checkout bit, I know this is very clumsy and there's no universally defined terms for this, but social commerce in my mind is when there's a, a checkout button on the social platform, but then you've got the broader journey, which for the purposes of today's conversation, I'm going to call social shopping. And I think, you know, we, we talked about the rise of voice search, the rise of image recognition tools, but the third thing that's really coming through in those changing behaviors is the, the huge growth of people that are researching brands and products that they're thinking of buying on a variety of different social media. So social networks are still one of the top places that they go, but question and answer sites, uh, all sorts of different places across the social web. Have you have you spotted anything in there from a marketer's perspective that you would really call out and say this is a trend you need to be keeping your eye on because it's going to have a massive implication for how people make purchase decisions? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think I would probably look towards older internet users and about how they're going to adopt these. Um, right. During the pandemic, I always think of it as like the tortoise in the hare when I think about this. So um, right. younger internet users, what we found is they're, they're behavior spiked during, you know, like the early stages of lockdowns and whatnot. And then actually they quickly settled down. Whereas the older internet users, their behaviors, and that includes stuff like researching on social media, they just kept growing. And in many cases, they've continued to grow, especially when it comes to like what different types of media they're using and and um, and what they're doing online. They're kind of like, it's, it's a very slow catch up, which is why I think about like the tortoise and the hare. And, um, what we're finding is that lots of these older internet users, baby boomers in particular, those are the fastest segments when it comes to growth on stuff like TikTok or, like you say, stuff like you know social research. And I think that yeah. having a broader demographic profile and more representation among these older groups is going to change things, going to mix things up a bit because it's not going to be those younger internet users sort of defining the rules of the game anymore. You, you touched on something that I think a lot of marketers are going to be quite surprised by there, the idea that there's these older, again, apologies if the term is inappropriate, but the older folks, when, when it comes to social media, I think there's a lot of misconception as to what platforms they're using and how they're using them. And that's one of, one of the bits that I find your data so useful for is to kind of just make sense of which platforms people are using, but also which ones 
they prefer and what activities they're doing on them. And I think one of the bits that really surprises me every time I go in and look at the data is just how diverse people's social behaviors are. So I'll quote your own data at you, but in the Q3 analysis, if we added in YouTube as well, we were looking at an average of seven and a half platforms used actively every month by the typical working age internet user, so 16 to 64. I think from a marketer's perspective, it doesn't necessarily come as a surprise that people are using different things, but what they're using them for, I think is the bit that's gonna come as a surprise. It almost strikes me that a lot of marketers tend to lump social media together into this like homogenous group and they run relatively similar activities across them. One of the things that really caught my eye in a piece of custom analysis I was doing for a client just a couple of weeks ago was the, the difference in use patterns and usage behaviors on TikTok versus on Facebook, for example. So two enormous platforms, both well over a billion users each each month. But when you look at the, the data in your survey says that more than 80% of TikTok users are going there to find funny and entertaining videos. And while that's quite an important part of Facebook usage as well, Facebook is still primarily a place where people go to interact with friends and family. Just sort of following through on the, those kinds of breakdowns, and please feel free to, to to promote the GWI data as much as you like in this answer, but which bits, when, when you're studying those social media behaviors, what are the things that are surprising you most that you think the marketer needs to understand about the different behaviors across those platforms? So, yeah, there's definitely those different use cases. Like you say, um, TikTok is just what you would expect it to be. It's that place of fine, funny, and entertaining content. It does actually see good um, figures for people using it for other stuff, even commerce related yeah. stuff. Um, right. And then you have, I always think of Facebook as a bit of a baseline. You know, it's, it's like the thing that it's the hygiene factor for social media where like everyone has a Facebook account and they don't necessarily use it for the kind of like they go to Instagram to get those that inspiration for either products, or yeah, travel, whatever. TikTok is much more of an entertainment platform. Facebook is that kind of place where you can just you know see what people you went to school with is doing now, or, you know, and stuff like that. Uh -huh. But I think one of the interesting things is that, um, and it's actually a very similar bit of analysis to something you've done in the past. So what you did is you looked at overlap between. Um, yeah different platforms and the main point there was that you know say if you're an SME with a lower marketing budget you're not missing out you can get the same people on the tried and tested platforms you don't have to try and overstretch your marketing budget you can actually see the same thing going on in uh, when it comes to specific reasons for using different platforms the the amount of crossover is actually really really considerable now obviously you have to factor in that like the actual environment on um, TikTok for like funny and entertaining videos is just a very different environment and things can go more viral. So there are factors like that, but actually the crossover in why people use different platforms, someone using TikTok for, to find funny and entertaining content is also using Facebook to find funny, funny, entertaining content. Someone using Twitter to find products is also using LinkedIn, probably a bad example, but you know, to, use <laughs> to find products. So I'm going to, I'm going to go back to one of the things that you said earlier, everybody has a Facebook account. I think, I know what you're saying exactly there, but I'm going to I'm going to just check with you here because I think this still comes as a shock to a lot of marketers. Your data does show that almost, not almost everybody, with the exception of China, the vast majority of internet users, even in those younger demographics, still have a Facebook account. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, there's well, yeah, there's a. I guess you could say the majority. I'll put say put my hand up, and I actually don't have a Facebook account, so I'm one of the few that don't. But um, gasp. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, okay. lots of people in China have uh, Facebook accounts. Facebook account is just there's so many people that use Facebook. It's especially in you know places outside of the country, the vast majority of people, and because it is the vast majority of people, that's another reason why you don't see really like fringe things going on on Facebook is because you're looking at pretty much everyone online anyway. So you're not going to look at a niche group of people to see interesting habits. It's just pretty much represents everyone in a way. Yeah. Chase, I had millions of questions, but we have actually had a question on LinkedIn from Craig Dandridge. So <laughs> Craig, as I try and read your question in real time, um, he's giving us an example. People in an Alaskan village look forward to getting broadband internet service so they could use YouTube videos to learn how to repair household appliances. It's a really good observation. It takes us back to one of the first things that you said. The number of people that are coming online for the first time, they're looking at educational videos. So you might look at education as being 
school kind of stuff, but also because <laughs> I am so utterly terrible at DIY, I confess this is one of the things that I have to do. So really good example, I don't live in Alaska. Obviously I live in Singapore, which is quite possibly the opposite of an Alaskan village, but I had to install a smoke alarm in our house at the weekend. Um, I was having trouble making sense of how I needed to drill into a solid concrete wall and make sure that it stayed there. It was actually into the ceiling. And sure enough, first thing I did straight onto YouTube to find out how to do these things. and. Sure enough, would you believe it? it was a brand, Home Depot, thank you very much. You don't even have stores in Singapore and yet you taught me how to do exactly what I wanted to do. I think this is the kind of stuff that I find fascinating from a brand perspective. You've got a lot of the brands that are making, you know, a lot of the brands that are asking questions about what to do on the internet are still in this mindset of not quite TV advertising. I think we've got past perhaps that horrifying thing we'd had a decade ago where it was just taking the TV ad and plonking it straight into social. But we're still not quite seeing people taking advantage of the native opportunities within, let's say, social media platforms and whatever else. Is there anything in your data that really you think would be a, the, the greatest of inspiration, if you like, in terms of when it comes to the content that brands might want to be looking at for, let's say, TikTok, because everybody's saying create TikToks rather than ads. Based on the insights that you've got of the audience, of the behavior patterns and all that kind of stuff, do we, does, does educational stuff work just as well on TikTok as it might do on YouTube? What, what, what can you tell us about insights into TikTok content? I would say TikTok, uh, I'm not a TikToker. Um, <laughs> I'm probably a bit old. Do you use any social media? <laughs> <laughs> it goes against what I just said about older people coming online. And <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure about like educational content. I think you know, like we've talked about, it's mainly people go there to see that quirky, viral, funny, funny content, you know. But one thing I would say is that one thing we've seen, and whether it's on TikTok, whether it's on Instagram, we're seeing that younger generations are, in, they de they're demanding more candid content, you know, the less polished right. the photo dumps. This is something kind that of we've, we've seen. <laughs> yeah, we, we call it the end of the curated self, because people are, and it kind of, I think it links back to the whole, like, you know, mental health, not having to, you know, project this fake image of yourself forwards. And I think that's really appealed to younger generations. And that's the kind of thing they want to see from uh, brands on social media, whether that's on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. They want them to have this less polished, you know, bring back, rein in your production standards a bit, appeal to people on a more human level. And that's what we're seeing among younger groups. And there's plenty of examples out there of that as well. That's going to be quite scary for the typical brand marketer, though, right? Because they tend to want to have great control. And polish has been a big, big part of the marketing industry for decades, especially once TV became a little bit more accessible. It's never widely accessible. But in terms of how brands go about doing that, is there anything either that you've been looking at in the data or the work that you've been doing with your teams and your clients in terms of insights that can help people understand how they take a, a step on that journey towards more authentic and less polished stuff? Well, I think the best way to do that is through your choice of influencers, really. Um, right. Obviously, you know, it goes without saying the younger generations are more engaged with influencers. Um, but you have like people like, I think it was Kylie Jenner or one of the Jenners um, who did this much more, I think, you know, no makeup, putting online anyway, showing, you know, the flaws as well as the, um, you know, just everything about you really. And, but then there's also like more micro influences. And I, I think that's what people, actually we did some specific research into this and people wanted influencers to show their true selves. And, you know, influencers can give brand the personality by sort of vicariously giving them that personality they need. Um, and I think that would be for me, like the most effective way of doing this. If you want to be candid, if you want to show that, you know, you're, you're engaged and associated with the kinds of personalities that aren't afraid to put their, you know, everything about themselves forwards, not even the, uh, not just the, um, you know, more polished bits. So you've got quite a lot of data on influencers within the, the GWI data set in terms of how many people are watching vlogs, how many people follow influencers on social media. Uh, any interesting trends in that that you're seeing that might point to where the future of influence and influencers is headed are we are we looking at a future that is still quite celebrity heavy are we seeing a genuine rise in the micro influencer or is that just a nice little story for the marketing press i think we're seeing a genuine rise in the micro micro influencer i mean it goes back to sort of the creator economy right and it's not just room for these you know millions of followers people there's there's lots of niches i think you know it goes you know the whole idea about a long tail um yeah 
uh, that whole concept where like the the actual long tail is where most of the demand is and baby below is more niche content. And I think exactly the same thing is going to apply to the influencer economy as well. There's a bunch of different people and they're going to be more authentic if they have small and more refined audiences, you know. Same thing happened in social media when Snapchat came around. It was about a more refined, smaller, controlled audience, um, and that you can, you know, access those people. So yeah, the same thing is going to happen, um, and is happening, I think, in, in the influencer side of things. And I think just to add on to that as well, older people, uh, there's huge growth in um, following influencers among older people as well. Huh. Um, yeah, like if you, if you look at the data, you definitely see a strong up and to the right trend there. So. There's going to be more content and personalities about the kind of things that matter to uh, older generations. And I'm not going to hazard a guess as to what that might be because I've probably offend some people. But... <laughs> <laughs> You're going to offend me being the old man in the room. Um, <laughs> just in case you can hear funny noises in the background, folks, we have a massive thunderstorm in Singapore at the moment. So if you hear peculiar noises, that's where that's coming from. It's not nothing dodgy. Um, so Chase, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued about the influence a bit because it is one of those things that I think perhaps a lot of marketers find it really difficult to get their heads around. GWI, obviously an amazingly rich tool um, for the subscribers. You can go super, super deep into the data, but you also have a public access tool for people who haven't even uh, paid to subscribe. So just create a free account. You can go in and dig. If somebody is relatively new to this and wants to get started, what would you suggest having a look at in terms of making a little bit more sense of what the trends and influencers are and what kinds of content you might want to discuss with those partners? So we, yeah, like you say, we have a, a free tier on our platform and um, mm. every single month we add a new survey onto that. And that survey covers five to 10 different topics. Anyone can access that. And it's a very intuitive platform as well. So what you've got to do is just sign up to the platform and then in the drop down menu, you'll see the data there. At the end of last yeah. year or towards the end of last year, we did a survey specifically on creators and about what people expect to see from creators the attitudes they have um, on creators whether they're you know positive or negative and yeah you can cut this all by demographics so i would definitely suggest someone going into there looking at what we have on offer in our in our um surveys and then drilling down into like you know also work i think you have to work from what the assumptions are because like yeah marketing industry is so full of assumptions that a nice place to start i always find is to say okay what do people assume and can i prove that wrong and it's usually very easy nice. to do that just by looking at age i think that would be the starting point <laughs> age is the most determining factor we see um across uh, all demographic stuff but that would be the main thing i would suggest someone to go and do okay um i'm aware that you and i in our Private chats can talk for days on end, and I suspect that the rest of the world may not be able to join us for uh, an internal chat. So uh, I'm going to ask anybody else that's tuning in, this is your last chance to drop your questions for Chase into the chat. While we're waiting for those, sorry, post those in the comments, folks, if you want to ask a question for Chase. I'll put them to in a moment. But just while we're waiting for those questions to come in, Chase, you're looking ahead a little bit. So in terms of the trends that you're most interested in, excited by, worried about over the coming months, if you were to point marketers in the direction of things that the data is telling you are going to be an important thing to keep track of this year. What, what are the two or three things you're going to look at? I guess one of the things I'm really interested in is uh, online streaming, especially for video content and paying for that. Um, right. I do feel like there's a reckoning point coming in, in a couple of ways. Maybe there's the, well, I hope that, <laughs> that was pretty bad. <laughs> Good. Um, <Good> shock. <laughs> Yeah, there's like there's the fact that not you know it's, it's reaching saturation point in the West, and I think we're seeing evidence, especially in places like the US, that um, there is a fatigue coming around. There's a ceiling for how many services people are willing to pay for, um, and it's obviously yeah. like there's lots of easy ways to get rid of like the stream, you know, the number of subscriptions you have. For example, like I was looking at my bank account earlier, and one of the options I had was like ditch, you know, the amount of subscriptions you had. So there's just lots of ways in lives that it's becoming easier to do. So there's not only this kind of like consumer factor, but I think also there's like a very poss big possibility of a competition change in online streaming. Because, right. you know, at one point Netflix dominated and that was yeah. because it really got there. It was a, um, what do you call it? It had that first mover advantage in a way and it just dominated the streaming market. And now you have those four massive media conglomerates who have been like, well, you know, this is obviously an opportunity and we're going to get into this. They've been 
lots of merger and acquisitions. They're spending absolutely enormous amounts of money on content. But you know, you have Netflix who don't use advertising. They don't um, get money off ticket sales. But what you find is that that's often the revenue that actually matters and paying getting that content to pay for itself. Whereas these mm-hmm. big media conglomerates do have that. So I think there's going to be some sort of tensions in competition. And I think the media conglomerates are going to really just probably recarve things in the future. And I think the people's assumption, you know, Netflix is almost a verb, but like, I think in the future, Netflix can get way more competition from these media conglomerates. And it's, you know, especially as they take their licensed content away from uh, yeah. Netflix. I mean, you're, you're, I'm going to, I'm going to show it. Your data showing quite clearly that the share that streaming platforms now account for when it comes to total TV time. So this is streaming TV as a share of everything, including cable um, broadcast and streaming as well. Almost half of our total TV time at a worldwide level now going through the streaming platform. So I'm guessing this is more about individual platforms like Netflix versus Disney Plus versus whoever else, as opposed to streaming as a thing. So streaming has plenty of room still to grow, I assume. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, I wouldn't say if you look at the trends like in those mature markets in Western countries, like you, what the uh, online TV streaming is actually not growing at a huge rate. And also, fundamentally, I mean, it is growing, don't be wrong, but not nowhere near kind of the kind of growth we, we're seeing in um, in some other countries, especially in those fast growth countries. But I think the interesting thing to note is that, like I say, appetite of paying. Like people, people are accepting of paying for media content like that in those yeah. more mature countries. But the growth in that is, I think, is pretty much hit a ceiling, at least in right. terms of like how many uh, subscriptions people were willing to have. But if you look at like Taiwan um, and other like countries in Middle East and Africa, you're finding that there is an increasing appetite for people to pay for these services. So the growth is coming from the rest of the world. You know, if you look at like um, earnings calls for Netflix, whenever like, you know, because people place such a huge emphasis on subscribers, everyone's yeah. being like, well, they're growing in the rest of the world. And, you know, it's the same thing. So one of the things that really surprised me in your data when, when we're talking about digital content, I know I said I was wrapping up, I've, I've scrapped the idea of wrapping up, we're just going to go on forever. Um, <laughs> when we, we're talking about digital content, the number of people who are willing to pay and who actually do pay for digital content each month really surprised me. It's really high. So I might have this stat wrong, but it's somewhere in the region of 75% of global internet users are paying for digital content of some description every month. And places like China, with that's highest now China living online I can kind of part of me understands that and part of me surprised by it because I suppose there's sometimes a stereotype that suggests that that wouldn't be what would happening so when it comes to again misconceptions about what people are willing to pay for when you're looking at things like video streaming whether it's audio streaming all that kind of stuff video games which we <laughs> we were going to talk about today but we've run out of time but it's all right we can we can come back for another chat about these things <laughs> another time your data will have updated by then but, in terms of the key trends of what people are spending on, anything standing out there that marketers might want to keep their eye on? Uh, well, I, I, the, the thing that comes straight to mind there is news. Um, right. Is uh, During the pandemic, we saw increased appetite to pay for news. And since the Ukraine conflict, we've just done a research study on the Ukraine conflict, which is freely available um, to anyone. It's about reactions to the Ukraine conflict across about 21 countries. Nice. Um, and in that, we've also found an increased appetite to pay for news. So, interesting. Think, you know, we live in crazy times. Like, you know, the last few years have definitely been interesting. And I think yeah. news has definitely been impacted by that. Um, yeah. That's That's really encouraging. I think a lot of the conversations that I'm having with clients, we're getting a lot of questions from the media about, you know, the reliability of the information that we find online, whether or not misinformation is becoming overwhelming and whether people can even distinguish between the truth and the propaganda. I think what you're saying there, this increased appetite and this willingness to pay for what I'm assuming would be more reputable news outlets, fingers crossed, that that's what people are willing to pay for, especially as people are, because one of the things also that your data shows is just how much people are going into social media to get their news. I think that the opportunity to balance that with some well-written 
balanced journalism it, it gives me a little bit of hope because i was like <laughs> some of the trends in that data were making me slightly nervous um on a slightly more optimistic note something some of that's making you feel optimistic about the future then to wrap up today's conversation chase one thing that you've seen in the data that makes you think actually it's not all doom and gloom there is hope for the future Ooh, i'm such a pessimistic person <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> <worry about you. laughs> i'm a cynic can i say um benefit uh sorry positive things well we are looking at uh like people's views of the future and uh -huh. um i think that there's definitely more positivity around people's personal finances um which we've seen Good. since the sort of you... later parts of the pandemic um <laughs> you've got me there i usually i'm used <laughs> I come from like a history slash sociology background, so we're usually looking at the bad things. So I guess like it's just you know uh, programmed in me to look for the things that interest me, which are probably the bad things. But um, yeah, there, there are definitely shifts <laughs> in people's perceptions of their uh, personal finances, which I think you know I mean that's a very foundational thing, and it can have huge impacts on lots of different things which interest marketers. Good stuff. Okay, that's and that again, that's something that you're tracking in your data as well as that optimism around finances and various. You've got attitude stuff in the survey that looks at all sorts of different future-looking emotions, right? We do. Yeah, we have um, we have a very strong uh, section which is like just dedicated to psychographics, and in there, for nice. example, we look at uh, people's positivity or negativity towards um, uh, the environment, towards their personal finances towards their country's economy as well. There's always interesting things that go on there as well. Firstly, like people never think it's going to happen to them. So they think that their the global economy is going to get bad, bad. Think their country's economy is going to be a bit bad, but they're going to be all right. Although obviously like during the pandemic and during the cost of living crisis, there's been some uh, shifts there. But also we often find that if you're looking at differences, because the way we ask that question is, you know, how do you think the following is going to um, do in the next six months and there's um get better stay the same or get worse and the main right. shifts that happen are people shifting from neutral you gen right. generally tend to find that the positive people stay positive and the negative people stay no negative but it's the undecided huh. the shift is so rather than looking at just uh stay positive uh sorry get better sorry and tracking that over time if you want to see the change you need to create like a composite score between the three Sorry, that's a bit technical. Right. And then you start to see the shifts going up and down. We saw really interesting stuff around um, economic uh, optimism in our old question, because we've changed the question. But since 2009 going on, was, it was very interesting because you saw the fluctuations going up and up, and it was all neutral people shifting positive. Yeah, I think particularly with things like rising inflation in certain countries around the world at the moment, then that's, that's exactly the kind of stuff that marketers want to get their heads around and see tracking that over time. Do people start to feel like it's more likely to impact them as an individual? I, I love that insight of it's going to happen to everybody except me. <laughs> yeah. Tapping into our eternal optimism as human beings. But yet seeing how that changes over time would be really interesting to give a perspective on where your future budgets might want to come through. Because it usually takes a few months lag, I've noticed, between changes in emotion and then changes in behavior as we sort of convince ourselves that we need to tighten the tighten the purse strings and whatever else. Uh, Chase, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm aware we could talk forever, but I don't want to keep you in particular because you have important things to do, like more data that I want to use in our reports yeah. as well. Um, I'm slightly hesitant to ask this as my last little bit for you today, considering you've said that you're not on majority of social media channels. But if somebody did want to get in contact with you after today, if they've got a question, if they just want to sort of socialize with you somewhere on the internet, what's the best place for people to find you? LinkedIn, I've got LinkedIn. Um, and more than happy to take any questions people have on LinkedIn. Good stuff. Thank you very much. And then I am going to suggest that perhaps we come back for another chat in maybe three to six months time, or at least somebody from your team. Maybe it's not always you that I'm bullying and putting on the spot with these awkward questions. But um, for the folks that have tuned in today, the folks that are going to be listening in after today's session, if you do have more questions for Chase and the GWI Trends team, please do feel free to share those in the comments. Drop me a private note if you want to do that. And we will, first of all, take note for those for our upcoming reports, but also for our future chats with the GWI team as well. So Chase, thank you so much for giving us your time today. Really appreciate all of your generosity and your insights and your wisdom um, and that little bit of optimism at the end to just force you to 
get out of that slightly pessimistic model. Um, <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will come into the chat, folks, in the, the comments on this. If you've got questions that you didn't manage to put in, then just pop them in now. I'll try and come back to that later. But with that, thank you all for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Insight Story. Thanks, folks. See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.